And so Romans 4, let's uh, listen now to God's holy, inerrant, and inspired word. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well, and to make him the father of the circumcised, who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Thus far, the reading of God's holy word may bless to our hearts now. <coughs> and please um, turn with me to the Belgian Confession, Article 22, which can be found in your Forms and Prayers book on page 175. So the Forms and Prayers book, page 175, and the, or, or the Song book on page 862. Continuing our series through the Belgian Confession of Faith, what we believe and confess as a Reformed Church based on God's Word, and we come now to Article 22, of the Righteousness of Faith. And so I'll read and you can just follow along. Article 22, the Righteousness of Faith. We believe that for us to acquire the true knowledge of this great mystery, the Holy Spirit kindles in our hearts a true faith that embraces Jesus Christ with all His merits and makes Him its own and no longer looks for anything apart from Him. For it must necessarily follow that either all that is required for our salvation is not in Christ or if all is in Him, then he who has Christ by faith has his salvation entirely. Therefore, to say that Christ is not enough but that something else is needed as well is a most enormous blasphemy against God. For it then would follow that Jesus Christ is only half a Savior. And therefore we justly say with Paul that we are justified by faith alone, or by faith apart from works. 
However, we do not mean, properly speaking, that it is faith itself that justifies us. For faith is only the instrument by which we embrace Christ, our righteousness. But Jesus Christ is our righteousness, crediting, crediting to us all His merits and all the holy works He has done for us and in our place. And faith is the instrument that keeps us in communion with Him and with all His benefits. When those benefits are made ours, they are more than enough to absolve us of our sins. Amen. <coughs> Brothers and sisters in Christ, is faith irrational? Is faith blind? There is a lot of confusion today as to what faith is. Many today believe that faith is irrational. In other words, that it's blind to reason. That you sort of have to turn off your brain in order to have faith. That faith and reason can't exist together. Uh, The atheist uh, biologist Richard Dawkins says that faith is the absence of evidence. Faith is the absence of evidence. If you have evidence, it's no longer faith. It's just evidence, he says. Uh, Bill Maher uh, wants to find faith as the purposeful suspension of critical thinking. That's what faith is, the purposeful suspension of critical thinking. And so you have those that view faith in that way. You also have others today who talk about faith as if it's wishing. If you wish it, you can make it happen. Or if you just believe it, you can make it happen. And if you believe in yourself, you can do anything that you set your heart to. Just have faith in yourself. As the famous song goes, when you wish upon a star, it makes no difference who you are. Anything your heart desires will come to you. If your heart is in your dream, no request is too extreme when you wish upon a star. And many think of faith like that. If you just believe in yourself, whatever, you can accomplish anything that you desire. And that's what faith is. Just believe. And these uh, cultural ideas about faith are the common in uh, themes in movies and in television and books. Uh, how often do you see a movie or a TV show where there's this, you know, often a character that represents uh, faith and religion on the one hand, and then another character who represents science and reason, right? Uh, you think of classic X-Files, Mulder and Scully, or uh, Lost, you've got uh, the two characters in that show as well, Jack and Locke, I believe was, was the guy's name. Um, but that's often what you have. You have these two opposing ideas of faith and reason, as if they can't coexist. Or how many movies are about someone just believing in themselves and fulfilling their dreams of becoming a star athlete or a pop star, and the moral of the story is you can do that too, whatever you believe in. Uh, you can do it. And so many today, both outside the church and inside the church, think of faith as blind to reason and as a leap of faith apart from evidence. Uh, In a new podcast called The Humble Skeptic, Shane Rosenthal, a pastor who uh, was one of the founders of the White Horse Inn and produced it for many years, um, in his new podcast, The Humble Skeptic, he examines the questions, is faith irrational and is faith blind? And interestingly, he mentions uh, that he created a Google Ngram chart. I didn't even know what that was. But I guess a Google Ngram chart is where you can chart the occurrence of words or phrases in all the scanned books that Google has in its database. And he found that the phrases blind faith and leap of faith came to prominence in the 19th and 20th centuries. And before that, almost no one spoke of blind faith and leap of faith. Gee, I wonder if that had something to do with the Enlightenment. Uh, He also said, he also said, I decided to check the world's foremost authoritative source for all things pertaining to the English language, namely the Oxford English Dictionary. Featuring 20 volumes and over 21,000 pages of content, the OED is not the typical dictionary you are likely to find in an average household. But thankfully, it's now accessible through an online subscription, so I created my own account and began investigating the true meaning of the English word faith. One thing that becomes clear 
with an exhaustive dictionary of this kind is that just about every word in the English language happens to have multiple definitions. And as it turns out, the word faith is sometimes used in a variety of ways. Sometimes it refers to an oath of loyalty, as with a good faith promise. But it can also refer to a system of religious belief, such as the Muslim faith. But among all the varying definitions I was able to discover in the OED, one I was not able to find was the idea that faith is believing something in the absence of evidence. That's, that wasn't even in there. And yet that is the most common understanding of what faith is today. He says, in fact, what I actually found was the complete opposite. According to the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary, one of the definitions of faith is this, belief based on evidence, testimony, or authority. Well, what's most important for us today is to ask the question, what is true faith as the Bible defines it? And is it closer to the definition of faith given by the Oxford English Dictionary? Or is it closer to the definition given by Richard Dawkins, Bill Maher, and others today who believe that it's the absence of evidence and reason? Is true faith irrational or blind to evidence and reason? Or is it looking within oneself? We'll see here three things about true faith this afternoon from God's Word. Uh, We'll see that true faith is a gift from God. And true faith has three elements. And third, true faith receives the righteousness of Christ. (coughs) So in the first place, true faith is a gift from God. We confess this in our confession of faith. Faith is not something that we can in and of ourselves just conjure up within. Remember that the Bible describes our condition apart from Christ before conversion as being dead in our sins and trespasses. That's Ephesians 2. And so if we are ever to believe, God must first do a miracle in our hearts. He must first regenerate our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And the way the Bible describes regeneration is with metaphors like a new birth, a new birth, or a spiritual resurrection. Uh, These are analogies that point to something that we can't initiate or do, apart from something happening to us that we had nothing to do with in and of ourselves, right? I mean, let me ask you the question, what were you doing before you were born? Did you decide to be born? Were you sitting there somewhere, I don't know, up in the clouds, I don't know, and thinking, well, I'd really like to be born today. (laughs) No, you didn't even exist. You didn't say, I'd like to be born, and I want to be born to these parents over here, and I want to be born in this country and in this location. Perhaps if you had that choice, you may not have chosen to be born in Saskatchewan or maybe a little some more tropical. The same could be said of dead people, right? Dead people don't do anything. They can't just decide they want to be raised from the dead. Before Lazarus was raised from the dead, he wasn't thinking to himself, you know what, today's a good day to be raised from the dead. I think I'll do that. I'm going to raise myself from the dead. No. You see, the new birth, regeneration, is a miracle. And faith is ultimately then a gift from God. If you have true faith in Christ, it's because God made you alive in order that you would believe. And this is the clear teaching of the Bible. For example, Ephesians 2 says, <coughs> for, by, excuse me, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. This faith is not your own doing. You have nothing to boast in. Or in 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul tells us that faith comes not of one's strength or virtue, but only to those who are chosen of God for its reception. He puts it this way. He says, we ought always to thank God for you, brothers loved by the Lord, because from the beginning God chose you. He chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He chose you to be saved through belief in the truth. 
where Paul says in Philippians 1 that it has been granted to you to believe in Christ. By the way, he also adds it's been granted to you that you should suffer for his sake as well. But we won't get into suffering this afternoon. For now, just note that he says that it's been given to you, it's been granted to you uh, to believe in Christ. Or think of finally Acts 16, how it says, one who heard us was a woman. Paul's saying, one who, one who, heard, what, one who heard Paul and, and his disciples, one who heard him preach the gospel was a woman named Lydia. From the city of Thyatira, she was a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. And this is what it says about her. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. The Lord opened Lydia's heart so that she would believe. Now, more verses could be given, but these are enough to prove that our confession is based on what the Bible clearly teaches. And so we confess here that we believe that for us to acquire the true knowledge of this great mystery, that is the great mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ that we just talked about in the earlier articles, that for us to acquire the true knowledge of this great mystery, the Holy Spirit kindles in our hearts a true faith. Now, one qualification that I'll, I'll add here is that just because God opens your heart to believe, that doesn't mean that God believes for you. You're not like a puppet or a robot and He believes for you. No, you believe. Once God makes you alive, you are the one who believes. God doesn't believe for you. It's, it's like when a blind person is given the gift of sight. That's a miracle. But once that miracle takes place, they are the ones seeing uh, one helpful way that's been said is um, John Piper says that it's, it's as if we could say God performs the miracle and you act the miracle. God performs the miracle and you act the miracle. And so he gets all the glory ultimately and your faith is a gift because he, out of unconditional grace, chose to open your heart. Now there's two th- applications that naturally come out of this first point that true faith is a gift from God and the first is is this if you have faith in Christ then to God alone be the glory give him all the praise and glory in your salvation and you have no grounds for boasting there's no room for pride in the Christian life there's no room for you to think that you're smarter and more intelligent than others because of the faith that you have it's a gift from God So give Him the glory. (coughs) The second um, application point is this. Pray. Pray for God to open the hearts of others like He did for Lydia. And don't give up praying for your lost loved ones. Uh, God can open anybody's heart. And if He can open up the heart of Saul... He can open up the heart of anybody, right? Paul was a great enemy of the Christian faith, and he was persecuting Christians and throwing them in jail, and imagine being the early Christians when Paul shows up to church to worship with you. I mean, you think that this guy's a spy or something. This is not for real. You got to be kidding me. This guy? But yeah, it was said of him that the one who was once seeking to destroy the faith is now the preacher of Christ. Right? He's, and so, don't give up praying for your lost loved ones, beloved. If God can open the heart of Paul, the apostle, He can open the heart of your friend or family member who does not know Christ and seems so stubborn and refuses to repent and believe. So keep praying. And secondly, then, we see here that true faith has three elements. True faith has three elements. Uh, The Greek word for faith is pistis, which is defined by one prominent lexicon as that which evokes trust and faith. In its verbal form, it also means to consider something to be true and therefore worthy of one's trust. Another form of this word means to be sure about something because of its reliability, to be convinced. And what we find in the Bible is that true saying faith has three elements to it. The first is knowledge. So there's three elements. Knowledge, assent, and trust. 
The first is knowledge. Uh, there's certain objective facts or truths that people must know in order to be saved. For example, when the Apostle John gives the purpose of his gospel, he says this in John 20, verse 30. He says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these signs are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Remember, belief there means that you might be convinced that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in His name. In other words, John's Gospel is his eyewitness testimony of the signs that Jesus did that prove that He is the Christ, the Son of God. And John wants you to know of these signs that took place so that you know that Jesus is indeed the Christ, the Son of God, and so that you would believe in Him and have eternal life. So he's not asking you to just take a blind leap of faith. He's saying, I saw all these signs. I've seen Him. He begins 1 John by saying, you know, that which we have seen, that which we have heard with our own ears and touched with our own hands concerning the Word of life, concerning Jesus Christ. And so he wants you to know these things about Jesus so that you would believe a certain objective knowledge or truth about Him, that He's the Christ, the Son of God, and that it's only through Him you have eternal life. Another example where we see knowledge as an aspect of faith is when the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, I delivered to you <coughs> as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Paul is appealing to things that took place in real planet Earth history. And he's saying, this is the Gospel in a nutshell, that Christ died, that He was buried, that He was raised. Believe in these things. And it's not a blind faith. This is not faith that is in the absence of evidence. No, Paul goes on then and says not only that these things are based on the Old Testament Scriptures themselves, which are a reliable, trustworthy source, but he also says that it's based on eyewitness testimony. He adds in verse 5, and that he appeared to Cephas, that is Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. You hear what he's saying there? He's saying, in other words, if you don't believe, he's not saying, just take my word for it, just, you know, take a leap of faith, take a blind faith apart from any evidence. No, he says, look, you don't believe me? Here's 500. I'm not just going to give you like two or three. I'm going to give you 500. And just 500 brothers he mentions because only men in those days could testify as eyewitnesses in a court of law. So that's not even counting all the women. There's probably a thousand eyewitnesses. And many are still alive today. And he's not talking about eyewitnesses that are like far off in some other land, far removed from where these things took place. He's talking about eyewitnesses that are in Jerusalem. Go talk to them. They saw Jesus in His resurrection body. This is not a leap of faith. This is not blind faith. This is faith based on evidence. And you see here, truth faith has an object. It's not just random, subjective faith and just whatever. What is the object of true faith? The object of true faith is Christ. Jesus Christ, His person and work. Our faith is in Jesus, the eternal Son of God who came in the flesh, who lived and died and rose again, ascended and is coming again. It's all summarized beautifully in the Apostles' Creed. And because true faith has this aspect of knowledge to it, this is why we need faithful preaching. People need to hear and know the gospel if they will ever come to true faith. Paul puts it this way in Romans 10. He says, But how are they to call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in Him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the Word of Christ. And so where does true faith come from? It comes from the Holy Spirit who kindles it in our hearts through 
the means of grace through the preaching of the Gospel. Through the preaching of the Word of Christ. And so there's this intellectual aspect to true faith. There's a knowledge that one must have of the good news of Jesus Christ. Our faith is based on God's Word which reveals to us objective historical facts which come from eyewitness testimony. And there are many evidences and reasonable arguments that can be made to defend the truth claims of the Christian faith. In other words, our faith is not irrational. It's completely reasonable. Which is why we read passages like the following. In Acts 17, it says, Paul went in, as was his custom, into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures. He didn't just say, just take a leap of faith. No, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures. When Paul was giving his defense before Governor Festus and King Agrippa in Acts 26, he said this, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words. For the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly. For I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. This is not some private event. It was publicly displayed before many eyewitnesses. And 1 Peter 3, here's an exhortation to you all. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Are you ready to share the hope within you and to give a reasonable defense of that? So the first element of true faith is knowledge. The second element of true faith is assent. This is just a short point or sub point. It's, uh, it's one thing to know the facts of the gospel. It's another thing to agree with those facts, right? Uh, some people grow up knowing what the Bible teaches. They can recite the Apostles' Creed. Uh, maybe they know the gospel. Maybe they did you know, Bible quizzing and memorized all kinds of Scripture verses. And they know what the Bible teaches. They know the gospel. They could tell it to you. But they reject it. They don't agree with it. And is that true faith? No. So it's not enough to, to know the gospel. One must also give assent to the truth of the gospel and agree with it and say, this is true. It is true. In 2 Thessalonians 2.13, it says we're saved through belief in the truth, not simply knowing the truth, but also believing it's true. Well, the third element of true faith is trust, and this is especially important, this aspect. Uh, the reason that this element is important to stress is because a person can also know the facts and they can give assent to the facts that they are true and still not trust those facts for oneself. This is like when James says that the demons, the demons believe that God is one and they shudder. And so a person can know the facts and agree with them and yet still not have true faith if they don't trust the gospel for themselves if they don't trust in Jesus for themselves. In our Heidelberg Catechism, we confess that true faith is not only a sure knowledge, but is also a wholehearted trust. A wholehearted trust that not only this is true for others, but for me also. That God saves me through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Uh, Charles Spurgeon once put it this way, he said, your condition is like that of a child in a burning house who, having escaped to the edge of the window, hung on by the windowsill. The flames were pouring out of the window underneath, and the poor lad would soon be burned, or falling would be dashed to pieces. He therefore held on with the clutch of death. He did not dare to relax his grasp until a strong man stood underneath and said, Boy, drop, drop, I'll catch you. Now, it was no saving faith for the boy to believe that the man was strong. That was a good help toward faith, but he might have known that and yet have perished. It was faith when the boy let go and dropped down into his big friend's arms. And Charles Spurgeon writes, There are you, sinner, 
clinging to your sins or to your good works. The Savior cries, drop, drop into my arms. It is not doing, it is leaving off doing. It is not working, it is trusting in that work which Jesus has already done. Trust, that is the word. Simple, solid, hearty, earned trust. Trust and it will not take an hour to save you. The moment you trust, you are saved. And so trust is the third element of true faith. We see this element of trust, especially in uh, the faith of Abraham, which we read about in Romans 4 a moment ago, <coughs> where Paul says, in hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old. Imagine that, being 100 years old and you're about to have a baby <laughs> and your wife is 90. He was as good as dead. It was a miracle. There was nothing that he could do to bring this about. This was all of God. But he did not uh, weaken in faith when he considered his own body or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why faith was counted to him as righteousness. You see, he fully trusted. He trusted that God was able to do what he had promised. And true faith in Christ is wholehearted trust that Jesus is able to do what he's promised, to save you from your sins and misery through his life, death, and resurrection. And so in order to receive Christ and His salvation, we must trust in Christ for ourselves. We must each be able to say that the gospel is not only true for others, it's true for me. And I trust it for myself. I trust that God forgives me and gives me Christ's righteousness and that He calls me His child and that He promises to preserve me by His Spirit and to bring me to glory. It's all by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone. Trust this for yourself. And if you do, then you can say with the Apostle Paul, as he says in Galatians 2, I have been crucified with Christ. Not just everybody else out there, but I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Do you realize that if you trust in Christ, you can say those words? He loved me and gave himself up for me. And so true faith says, this isn't true just for others, it's true even for a sinner such as me. Our Belgian Confession beautifully summarizes these things when it says that the Holy Spirit kindles in our hearts a true faith that embraces Jesus Christ with all his merits and makes him its own and no longer looks for anything apart from him. So true faith is a gift from God, and it has three elements, knowledge, assent, and trust. And then third, true faith receives the righteousness of Christ. When we speak of justification by faith alone, we want to be clear that we do not mean that faith itself is the grounds of our righteousness before God. This is why it's technically better to say that we are justified by grace through faith. Uh, we all, it's fine to just, you know, we're justified by faith alone. We say that all the time. Reformed theologians say it all the time. But we need to be clear here that it's our, our faith in and of itself isn't what justifies us. We're justified by grace through faith. Faith is but an instrument that receives the righteousness of another. And uh, that's important to stress because we're so prone to smuggle in works to our salvation. We're so prone to want to have a little bit of righteousness, have a little bit of works in our salvation that we do. And so people say things like, you know, God has done this for you. He sent His Son. Jesus died for your sins. Now you just need to do your part. You just need to do your part and believe. Now while there's some level of truth to that, we have to be, as I said earlier, you're the one that actually believes. Um, we just have to be careful where the stress lies. We don't want to turn faith itself into a work. As if God is impressed 
by our faith and based on the goodness and quality of our faith, He saves us as if we merit that in some way. That's mixing works in our salvation. God's grace is a gift that cannot be earned by our works. And faith and grace, faith and grace go hand in hand, while works and reward go hand in hand. And when we mix faith and works in our justification, we in fact nullify grace. Our righteousness before God is no longer a gift, but a reward in which we can boast. <coughs> but Paul wants to make it absolutely clear, as we heard earlier in Ephesians 2, but also in Romans 3, that we, are, we cannot boast in anything in our salvation. He says in Romans 3, then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And so, based on God's Word, we confess here in our Belgian Confession, Article 22, that Christ is a complete Savior. He doesn't need anything from you or me. The only thing you contribute to your salvation is your sin. And He's your Savior completely. And so we confess that it must necessarily follow that either all that is required for our salvation is not in Christ, or if all is in Him, then he who has Christ by faith has his salvation entirely. Therefore, to say that Christ is not enough, but that something else is needed as well, is a most enormous blasphemy against God, for it then would follow that Jesus Christ is only a half-savior. And therefore, we justly say with Paul that we are justified by faith alone or by faith apart from works. However, we do not mean, here's that clarification, however, we do not mean, properly speaking, that it, is by, that it is faith itself that justifies us. For faith is only the instrument by which we embrace Christ, our righteousness. But Jesus Christ is our righteousness, crediting to us all His merits and all the holy works He has done for us and in our place. And faith is the instrument that keeps us in communion with Him and with all His benefits. When those benefits are made ours, they are more than enough to absolve us of our sins. They're more than enough. And so rest completely in Christ. You see, God doesn't look at the quality of our faith and declare us to be righteous. He declares us righteous on the basis of Christ and His righteousness alone. And in the act of justification, we simply rest upon Christ and receive the forgiveness of sins and the righteousness of Christ and become heirs of eternal life. As Paul says in Romans 4, to the one who does not work, but trusts Him who justifies the ungodly, His faith is counted as righteousness. And beloved, th though your faith may be weak, be encouraged because even a weak faith gets a strong Christ. You and I aren't justified by the strength of our faith, but by the strength of the object of our faith, namely our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In the words of John Owen, he said, a little faith gives a whole Christ. He who hath the least faith hath as true an interest in the righteousness of Christ as the most steadfast believer. Others may be more holy than he, but not one in the world is more righteous than he, for he is righteous with the righteousness of Christ. You who have but a weak faith have yet a strong Christ, so that though all the world should set itself against your little faith, it should not prevail. Sin cannot do it. Satan cannot do it. Hell cannot do it. Though you take but weak and faint hold on Christ, He takes sure, strong, and unconquerable hold on you. Isn't that wonderful to think about? To the one who does not work, but trusts him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful good news once again about our justification by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. And we thank you for the gift of true faith that you've given to us who have believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ alone for salvation. We know that it's completely you who opened our hearts to believe, so that we would believe and trust in Him. And so help us to remain humble in the Christian life. Help us to not boast in ourselves, but to boast 
in Jesus Christ and Him crucified alone. <coughs> and help us to live lives of thankfulness, to obey Your law out of gratitude. And Father, help us to share this hope with others and open the hearts of our lost loved ones that they would believe in Christ. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.